Welcome back to week four, and in our final video of this week, we're going to talk about precipitation. So, precipitation, uh, we're going to get into how it's measured and what is it, and then we'll talk about how clouds produce different types. So what is it? Well, it's basically water droplets or ice crystals that get too large to stay aloft in the air, and gravity pulls them down to the ground surface. So this can be um, rain, it can be snow, and it can be hail or sleet. So how is it measured? We use things like rain gauges or rain gauge networks, tipping bucket rain gauges, and a, a weighing type rain gauge. So in this photograph here, you can see what a regular rain gauge is. They have a plastic funnel um, that filters water down into a plastic tube where you can measure how many inches of rain fell. Um, and um, tipping buckets, basically, uh, if, as the rain falls, it fills up a bucket and um, when that bucket fills, it tips over, and then as every time it tips, there's a little electronic counter that counts how many tips happened, and that each tip means a certain volume of water has fallen. And there's also a weighing type, so basically weighing the amount of water that has fallen. You can also use Doppler radar, which is pretty cool. Um, Doppler radar is uh, what's called radio detection and ranging. Um, this can actually look inside a cloud instead of looking and just seeing a wall of white. You can actually see what's happening all the way through that cloud. So here's a picture of a Doppler radar station and the image that is produced. So basically this tower emits microwave pulses that um, travel through the atmosphere and end up striking raindrops or cloud particles, um, those tiny little water vapor, um, uh, water parcels that have condensed in that cloud. And then some energy is then reflected back to the radar unit. So if there's more precip or the cloud's denser, there's more water vapor molecules, then um, we end up being able to measure how much moisture is there, how much rain is falling, and they can measure the amount, the location of that cloud, and how fast um, that cloud is moving, and also the uh, of amount of rainfall that's falling. So basically more reflection, the more precip, and that's what these colors mean on this image. Blues are light, and then the reds are very high, and this is obviously a hurricane that you can see hitting Florida. There's also um, methods of measuring precip from space, which is pretty cool. This is um, the TRIM method, Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission. So this measures precipitation from space via satellite. Um, so we can measure um, the intensity um, of storms and precip. This is um, really helpful for places that you, we can't read with Doppler radar, so places that are out in the middle of the ocean, so we don't have a land surface to mount one of these Doppler radar stations, so we have to rely on, on satellites. So we can do the same things. We can measure precipitation, the rate of precip, temperature of the cloud top, which is pretty cool, and it can see the cloud cover as well. So here's a, an image down here you can see, which is pretty neat. Um, and if you're curious, um, I will post this link. Um, there's a, a the change periodically that you can see very short video clips of um, the um, data they've collected recently which is pretty cool. So we can also measure the amount of um, snow using what are called snow courses or snow tell stations. So here is a picture of a snow tell station here. Um, basically what we do with these is they will um, have a, an area where the snow builds up. They can use this ground truth marker to help them measure how much. We've got a snow depth sensor, antenna, solar panels, temperature center, snow tell shelter. So all sorts of stuff at this location. So usually what happens um, at these um, snow tell stations, we have several locations that they will have these stations set up and they'll average the data. And um, what they can do is collect all the snow, measure the depth with their sensor, they can also melt the snow down, and um, use this water equivalent of 10 to 1. So 10, um, say 10 inches of snow equals 1 inch of water. 
um, and that's a similar idea up here on this uh, this sign as well. In this location, this is the conversion that they have used um, for this location in the Rocky Mountains. So we use snow tell stations to measure snowfall. Um, in some cases, uh, they'll actually measure. Um, you can take the rain gauge, take the inner funnel out, and and just use the inner cylinder to measure how many um, inches of snow have has fallen as well. So depending on how important that number is to you, um, they'll use different methods. So the snow tell stations are far more accurate than using your rain gauge. We also um, have precip that's produced. So how do clouds produce precipitation? Um, here we've got uh, rain in the Grand Canyon and then snow up on Mount Hood. Um, basically, to produce precipitation, we need condensa condensation nuclei and um, we also need to have collision coalescence occur or the Ber Bergeron process um, as well. So I'll explain each of those and then we'll talk about how um, these different types of precip are produced. So if we think about condensation nuclei, um, we have water vapor, it's condensing on a particle, so things like salt, dust, pollution, pollen, um, would um, be in the atmosphere, um, floating around in the air, it's small enough to stay aloft, and um, really relatively small size. And over time, we'd have water condensing on that nucleus and form a cloud droplet, uh, which is a little bit larger. Um, and then eventually, over time, we'd get a uh, typical raindrop, which is much, much bigger, about two millimeters in size. Now, the problem with this condensation nuclei idea and forming precip is that this process of the water vapor condensing on these condensation nuclei is very, very slow, and it won't produce the volumes of precipitation or produce at the speed that we see it form on the earth and in the atmosphere, we need other methods to help. And those methods include the collision coalescence and the Bergeron process. So um, the collision coalescence method, uh, we start with that um, water droplet that has condensed on the condensation nuclei. As these, these um, water droplets are moving in the cloud, they're colliding with one another. Sometimes when they collide, they combine to form a larger particle. So over time, as you have a larger particle, it's gonna bump into more stuff, and then we're gonna get a bigger and bigger particle. Eventually, it's gonna be big enough to be pulled down to the ground surface. Um, and here you can see um, in some of these cumulonimbus clouds where you have a lot of air motion happening in the cloud, we can increase the amount of collisions that happen and produce precipitation pretty fast. So this produces, um, um, so we need to have a range of droplet size, so different sized particles up there. Our cloud thickness helps, so the thicker the cloud, the taller it is, the more moisture is present, the more droplets are present. We need to have updrafts in the cloud as well to help move those particles around. And then also electric charge can help. They can actually be attracted to one another. We can also have um, precipitation form through the Bergeron process. And your textbook goes into this in great detail. Um, so basically, in a cloud, you can have, this is through ice crystal um, formation, in a cloud it can have both water droplets and rice crystals, so this would be in a, typically in a high cloud or a cumulonimbus cloud. Water droplets that exist in a cloud that's below freezing are often called supercooled droplets. Um, and these ice crystals that we have form on ice nuclei, same idea, clay, bacteria, ice, stuff that's in the air. Um, and when we have a cloud that is saturated with moisture, the number of water of molecules leaving and adding to each of these particles, each the ice and the water droplets, is going to be the same. So we're going to have equal um, adding and subtracting to these particles. Although, um, oftentimes the amount um, that is released from these water droplets um, is more. We end up with an abundance of water vapor around these 
water droplets. And because we have more here, there's a higher pressure around these, and they migrate to an area of lower pressure, which would be around this ice crystal. Uh, it takes less energy for those water vapor molecules to leave the water droplets than it is to leave the ice crystals. So they tend to migrate onto the ice crystal, making the ice crystal bigger over time. So we get snow building up or ice building up in that way. So we have um, these crystals growing in size. And here's a picture showing some of these wispy clouds. Oftentimes when you see wispy white up in the atmosphere, that's a sign that there is actually snow up there or ice crystals. So over time, that ice crystal can get large enough to actually um, get bigger and bigger. Same idea as um, the water droplet as it travels around. We can have those super cool droplets adding to that ice crystal. This produces grapple, grapple snow pellets. So these actually can then break apart into small splinters as you can see here and then again form more grapple, break apart. So it's this kind of ongoing process. In cold clouds, some of these can, collisions are a little bit more gentle, or we have just a slow accretion that happens, and we can build these beautiful um, dendritic snowflakes that you can see here. Um, so in the winter time, um, we get mostly snow, um, and when you're up on the mountain or where I grew up in, in uh, New York State, we get a lot of these beautiful little um, dendritic snowflakes that develop. Um, so if we look at our what's happening in the atmosphere when this precip is formed, we have the surface here, and then um, we also have increasing elevation. We have this graph where we have 32 degrees, and then we have below um, freezing at 25 degrees. So this green dashed line is going to represent the temperature um, of the air as you increase in elevation. So here we've got a cloud producing precipitation. The air is all below freezing, so these beautiful snowflakes can fall without changing into another form and hit the ground. So we have to have below te uh, freezing temperatures to produce these features. So um, we have um, different types of snowflakes can develop based on the temperature of the cloud. So when it's a little bit on the warmer side, zero degrees Celsius, we form needles. When we get cooler, we get these dendrites that can form. Even cooler, we get plates, so more um, water is accumulating, more water, water molecules are accumulating onto that structure. And then here we can get columns, so even more can accumulate. And here are some um, pictures of what some snowflakes look like. So in the winter, we can also get um, sleet. And sleet happens when, uh, if you have that same situation, you have cold layer producing those nice dendritic snowflakes. Then those snowflakes fall into a warm layer. They start to melt over time. And as they fall, they get back into another cold layer and they refreeze. And then we have um, these small pellets that form over time. So that's sleet. And then we also, also can get freezing rain. So this is where you have snow produced at the top cold layer have a really large warm layer and then right before that rain hits the surface we go through another cold cold layer uh, oftentimes the land is much colder than the air and then as that rain hits the surface it immediately freezes really 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 dangerous um, a few guys were around hood river last winter 2012 really nasty ice storm we had uh, no power for several days in hood river and off and on so here you can see how uh, these ice crystals have developed on everything outside. These are little tiny berries that have um, accumulated that freezing rain. Every branch on every tree, all of the power lines just coated in ice, makes them really heavy, and then collapse. So we have a lot of damage uh, left over from that storm. We can also produce hail. Um, hail is common in cumulonimbus clouds. So this is where you have um, particles of ice that can range from pea size to golf balls and even larger. The largest found was in South Dakota, 8 inches in diameter and 1.8 pounds. Huge, crazy amount of damage produced from this. These are in cumulonimbus clouds, so we start out with maybe a small water droplet that's then brought into a uh, area that's below freezing, it freezes solid, and then it travels through this cloud 
through from these crazy drafts that exist and over time it's slowly accumulating more and more ice on that um, that on that little pellet um, and over time it gets big enough to a point where those air currents in the cloud can't hold it up um, in the cloud and it falls as hail on the surface so depending on the drafts in the cloud you might get larger and larger hail um, because if there's more energy in that cloud it can hold up larger particles so here's some examples you can see there's some smaller hair, hail particles and then even larger ones there's some photographs in your textbook of uh, um, hail um, that has fallen and scientists have actually cut it open and you can see these concentric circles showing how it's actually gotten larger and larger over time. We can also um, actually produce artificial precipitation if anyone's ever been to the East Coast or witnessed any snow making. Uh, if you go skiing, if you're uh, ski a skier or a snowboarder, um, this is artificial precip. So um, they are requiring temperatures to be below freezing and you need a condensation nuclei and sometimes there's something added to the water as it's sprayed into the air to actually produce this um, fake snow <laughs> which is pretty pretty interesting um, and this is these pictures are both in New York State and then we can also have cloud seeding uh, this is something that's been um, in your book a little bit and studied by uh, some meteorologists and science, atmospheric scientists. So basically you're adding condensation nuclei to a already existing cloud to try to produce precipitation. So this is the idea of uh, an area that might be in a drought. You want more moisture to fall in that area. Let's try to make it happen. Um, and that can have some um, interesting results. And the research on that is still um, up in the air on whether or not it is beneficial or not. So I think um, we will stop there. If you're curious about cloud seeding, uh, we can talk in lab. I will try to find some websites and um, I will see you in lab this week.